Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff, and today I'm going to give a very informal update on my past uh, research of like a past two, three months on shape abstraction of unknown spacecraft using neural networks. So start with the problem statement. I'll go through some literature review in terms of how the shape, how we can represent the shape of an unknown spacecraft. And I'll talk about like the methods that I've taken a very quick qualitative results of what the um, extracted shape looks like and the lessons learned from this past research. So as always, our ultimate goal uh, regarding this is the sustainability uh, around Earth orbit. With so many more things being added into our orbits, we want the capabilities to prolong the lifetime of the existing assets on space and also capture any assets that are no longer functioning or not needed. So in these efforts, reliable tracking of targets, position and orientation or pose is crucial for safe approach, docking and capture mechanisms. So previously, as you uh, most of you know, uh, my research has spoke, focused on using a monocular camera to determine the post of a known non-cooperative target. So we're assuming that we have uh, at our disposal the 3D model of the target spacecraft, either from our clients or this is a very well-known object that we have like a public repository of these models of sort, which allowed us to use machine learning to basically recreate the synthetic images at large scale of this particular uh, spacecraft used at the train our neural network and tested on the exact same target. So in this case, the what became the most important um, topic to discuss was basically how we're going to bridge this gap of image quality and the characteristics between the synthetic training and the spaceborne target objects. So obviously, uh, this only works on very limited situations and scenarios such as servicing of a known target spacecraft. If we want to handle the unknown spacecraft or unknown debris, for example, we need to be able to basically get rid of the assumption of the availability of the target. So the new problem statement is to determine not only the post, but also the shape of an unknown uh, non-cooperative target spacecraft, um, such that we can handle target with no a priori information, but also this also relieves us from the requirement of having to retrain and validate our neural network for new target every single time we have a new mission going on. Instead, with this capability, you just have this and you know deploy to multiple targets at one like all at the same time or not. So, in terms of the ultimate pipeline of how the neural network plays into this part. Um, in literature what, and in the past missions, what was done in terms of optical navigation about unknown spacecraft or asteroids was basically you're trying to reconstruct the point cloud of the target object. This is done by extracting some features like SIDs, orbs, um, you know, like, and this was used in along with the navigation comma filter to refine and the target shape, the target point clouds, and also use that to basically update the pose of yourself, the spacecraft with respect to this object in space. So basically, the initially what we had thought of in terms of the role of a neural network is that by taking a single image of the unknown target, we can extract a very coarse shape of the target that would allow us to basically kickstart the shape reconstruction step. Um, whether in the frame of the structure for motion or simultaneous localization and mapping or SLAM. And we can also use uh, take advantage of the temporalness of the sequential images in our rendezvous trajectories, which would allow us to basically refine the output of our neural network um, in a sequential manner, such that this shape extraction becomes more and more accurate as well. So right now, we're only going to focus on just the neural network part, basically, take a single image and try to get as best as possible the shape representation of the target. So now we have discussed what are some of the shape representations of an unknown target that we can use. So there are a lot of options when we look into the literature, especially from the computer vision um, field. 
One is the volumetrics. So these are things like voxels, um, which basically takes the 3D space and you discretize it in the same way you discretize the 2D space of an image into pixels. Of course, unlike images, which is in 2D, if you do this in 3D, then as you have more and more resolution, this becomes increasingly, the memory just increases like dramatically. And also the computation on these voxel representation also becomes very um, demanding as well. So there were some you know, efforts to relieve this um, memory heaviness. And one of them is basically octrees. And what the octrees do, uh, do is you start with the low resolution voxels, you identify the areas that requires more resolution, and you only try to discretize further in that, um, in that region. So you can see that here, starting from the 32 by 32 by 32, instead of having 128 in all three dimensions, we're seeing a, you know, these high resolution areas at a very restricted range compared to just doing it in the entire 3D space. But still, um, this is very not good, especially if you want to run this in our um, spacecraft hardware. So next is point clouds. Which had uh, which is more manageable in terms of the uh, memory requirement compared to voxels, but in the end, this is still um, just a bunch of points. Um, and in three D uh, reconstruction field and computer vision, uh, what they also want is the basically they want to create this into a mesh. So here we have no connectivity information in terms of like the points. Um, if we want to you know, separate these models into like different parts, for example, then the connectivity in terms of like a single parts become more important, which requires post-processing algorithms that are also computationally demanding as well. So there has also been an effort to take the image or point cloud and then try to recreate meshes using neural networks as well. Um, now, this also means that you, the neural network has to predict not only the vertices, but also the connectivities of these vertices as well. So that also becomes a algorithmically um, complex task. So some examples are you start with a just a sh um, like a cube or a sphere of a mesh with like certain resolution. And basically, it's tr you can try to re um, recursively deform this mesh into the final mesh that you want uh, to end up with, uh, which is easy, uh, which which makes certain tasks easy. For example, the connectivity of the vertices is are already defined in your initial mesh. So in this uh, sort of transformation, that information should be kept as well when you get to this final airplane, for example. Now, the fourth one is implicit models. And here, instead of using vertices like and mesh, basically we're trying to abstract these complex parts of the target using a very simple geometry. So up here, for example, um, this one just uses cubes of different dimensions. Here we're using a parametric family of shapes called superquadrics. But there are also other ways of implicitly defining the model. So for example, here, this uh, work is trying to define the convex uh, 3D geometry using a union of hyperplanes um, that are tangent to the surface of this uh, of this convex shape. And the output is that you use an assembly of this numerous convex shapes to approximate the target uh, model. So now with that sort of a literature review done, we'll go on to uh, the methods that I've taken. So in terms of the desirable features of shape representation of spacecraft in particular, um, I've basically identified two things. One is that unlike a lot of objects uh, here on Earth, spacecraft in general, so we're excluding debris from our conversation at the moment, a spacecraft in general have very restricted range of shapes that have a lot of common shapes that are recurring. So we want to be able to encompass these common structures in modern satellites like cubes, 
or flat planes for solar panels uh, or cylindrical shapes. Um, if you think about like ISS, for example. And also we want this to be simple, um, which agrees with the memory efficiency um, that is required by the onboard satellite, uh, onboard computers, uh, which also means that if there's a way we can parameterize the shape using a very few parameters compared to thousands or tens of thousands of vertices of the point clouds, plus the connectivity of these vertices, this would be something that's very uh, helpful for us. And last thing is that we, if we are going with this like sort of parametric family of shapes, then we need a way of identifying explicit and implicit surface functions. So what that is, is that explicit surface function means if you have some implicit uh, representation of the target, you can convert that information into explicit point clouds of the target. So like you see on the left. Implicit surface function means is if you're given any point in 3D space, can you identify if this point lies inside the surface that this, that um, describes this model or is it outside? So the reason these two functions are important is because these are key to unsupervised learning in a sense that the only label of these images we have are 3D mesh models of the target spacecraft, and we're not doing any manual labeling of that. So we're not going to go into every single 3D model and identify, okay, this is the solar panel, we're going to label this as solar panel, or we're going to label like the orientation of the solar panel with respect to the body. You could do it, but in the far future, when we have like thousands or tens of thousands of uh, satellite models, that will become extremely manual labors. So doing it in an unsupervised way, by only utilizing the 3D mesh model of the target as our label. Uh, that simplifies the learning process a lot, but it also requires these two key functions. So I've settled to superquadric um, just because out of all options that were given in the lib review, this um, agreed the most with the requirements that I've uh, selected. So what is superquadric? This is basically a parametric family of various shapes. So it's characterized by five parameters, three that defines the, sh uh, the size, so the size along the three principal axes of the model frame, and also two parameters that defines the shape of the target. So this is the positive value that can actually go beyond two, but to confine ourselves to convex shapes, they have to range from zero to two. So if you see here, when both are zero, we see a cube shape. When epsilon two is one, we have cylinder. When both parameters are one, we see that it's sphere. And then we can also see like kind of diamond shapes like octahedron and all that. And the nice thing about the superquadric is that it also has well-defined explicit and implicit surface functions. So this is this gives us the coordinates of a point on the surface of, of the superquadric given these two um, spherical uh, coordinate angles, and this function also defines the distance to the surface. So if this function is one, that means our point lies exactly on the surface. If it's less than one, is inside, and so forth. Now we can also add more. Um, information here. So what you can do is do a linear tapering along uh, z-axis here. So what this allows us to do is that it allows us to capture some of these more uh, rarer side of the uh, spacecraft shape using only one superquadric. So like uh, like here, for example, with grays, you can see that this requires the tapering along on one side along this um, like uh, this vertical axis. And for things like uh, like a dragon capsule here, this also resembles more of uh, like a like a circular cone. Now the challenges here are oh, uh, so, so there has been a work or multiple works that use superquadric for shape abstraction of unknown of unknown shape of unknown objects. 
But in terms of applying this to spacecraft, I noticed three uh, challenges. So one is actually a pretty well-known um, issue with the superquadric, and that's numerical instability. So if you look at the explicit, explicit, actually both of these surface functions here, you can see that when the shape parameter epsilons, either one of them um, gets infinitely close to zero, um, you cannot really evaluate these functions. So you can see that if any of them goes to zero, you're not going to be able to basically uh, sample the points from all different uh, faces of the cubes, for example. And also here, I mean, the exponents goes to infinity. So you're not really going to be able to evaluate it. The problem is that the epsilon going to zero, which means we're going to have very sharp edges in our superquadric, that's actually the very common um, geometry in satellites. So especially if you think about the cube sets that are becoming more and more uh, popular, uh, and cube sets are basically made entirely of cubes. So it would be sad to not be able to use basically epsilon equals zero. Um, also, what the literature has done is that they just don't worry about this. They just set a hard limit on the lower bound of the epsilon to be like 0.1 which makes sense if you want to abstract of uh, abstract the shapes of very arbitrary objects on earth but with the satellite that's a little uh it's not good uh the second issue is the parametric sampling so basically we need to be able to sample uniformly from the surface of these super quadrics and i'll explain why that's important for uh, learning uh, or training the neural network but the problem also is, well, there's an issue with epsilon going to zero, but also when one side becomes extremely small compared to the other dimension. So if you think about like very flat objects like solar panels, um, existing methods for sampling points, and this has to be parametric uh, sampling because these points all have to be a function of our shape and size parameters of superquadric. So maintaining that relationship while also uniformly sampling from the superquadrant, that also becomes a challenge that really ha didn't have to be um, covered in like computer vision in general, uh, because they rarely have a very flat objects like we do for every single spacecraft. And the third one is, how are we going to find the optimal number of superquadrants to describe our thing? So with the cube sets, yeah, we can see that these are three cubes with the Soyuz, maybe four or five. But if we have a very complex objects, how is the neural network going to decide how many superquadric primitives that we need to use? And this is actually um, quite challenging um, because the way neural, neural networks are built is that it needs to have a fixed uh, inputs and fixed outputs um, in terms of the dimensionality of the tensors of the input and output. So you, it's kind of difficult to design a neural network so that it outputs always the optimal number of primitives. So how did I tackle the numerical instability? Uh, or, or these like three challenges. The first one is to restrict the range of superquadrics. So if you actually look at here, a lot of the shapes that are beyond epsilon equals one are not something that you, rare, uh, you commonly see or like you barely see, actually, in modern spacecraft. So um, also one note, the difference between this epsilon 2 equals 2 and 0 is that here in, this is basically like a infinity norm. So you have a cube shape, and this is like a one norm. So you have like a diamond shape. So if you have different length uh, or size, this is going to become a very diamond shapes, um, which is not something that you see very often in spacecraft. So we can sort of restrict ourselves into uh, this range. In this work, I'm going, to, I'm going to further restrict the range by setting epsilon 1 equals to 0. And that's because that's just the most common geometry that you see in spacecraft. With missing out on sphere, you might miss out on things like Sputnik or like the tip of Soyuz, but we're, we'll start here, and it would be um, somewhat trivial to extend it to epsilon to the range of epsilon one going from zero to one. So, 
That also means we need to fix the surface functions. And here, we actually have a very nice way of modifying our implicit surface functions. And for the explicit functions, this actually essentially becomes the points along the sides of the cylindrical shape, for example. Um, so you need a way of sampling from the top and bottom, but that's also uh, somewhat trivial as well. I'll go through this very quick. Now, uniformity of parametric sampling. So also introducing the linear tapering, what I'm doing here basically is, okay, we're going to do it from three sides. So we're going to sample uniformly from this 2D super ellipse three times um, for different number of sides based on the approximate ratio of the area of the top, bottom, and the side of the super quadric. And for the side, you just add a random Z coordinates to that samples for top and bottom. The Zs are fixed, Z coordinates are fixed to like alpha three minus alpha three, but then you just um, basically sample the radius by square root of the random number. So now the question becomes, how are we going to uniformly sample points from the super ellipse? So what I, is and is this is a very quick trick, which is instead of just sampling from a primal, from a super quadric, which actually becomes difficult to do it in parametric way in case we have these corners for epsilon equals zero, epsilon equals zero. we're going to instead um, sample from these dual super ellipse, which is defined by the normal vectors actually of the original super ellipse. And you see here that these are essentially differ by the 45 degree uh, rotation and some scaling factor. So we're just going to sample from dual super ellipse, which is defined for the dual uh, shape parameters ranging from one to two. So we avoid the numerical instability. And basically sample from that, rotate, apply the shape and apply the size and apply some like scaling that needs to be done. And you see here on the red is the original super ellipse, and the black is the sampled, uniformly sampled um, points along the dual super ellipse that was rotated and, you know, uh, size and all that. So they're not exactly identical, um, unless the epsilon is the one or zero. But I'll say that it's like very close enough, and this gives us a numerically stable way of sampling points along the super ellipse. And this also works for very flat um, shape as well. So you see that for epsilon equals 0, uh, 0.1, or actually, yeah, 0 and 1, but also for 1 to 10 to 1 to 100 ratio of the size. So this gives us a good tool to use for sampling parametrically the points along on the surface of our various superquadric shapes, regardless of how flat they are. Now, minimizing the number of super quadrants, this is something that's um, still working on. So for now, I'm going to just output constant number of super quadrants and just deal with it. Oh, uh, yeah. So currently, I'm just outputting uh, four primitives. And for each primitive, the neural network is regressing these following parameters. So size and shape of the primitive, the position and rotation of this each primitive with respect to some global coordinates of the model and also the tapering factor. So the key training loss um, are two folds. One is the occupancy loss. So basically, you need to pre-process the model um, such that for um, within the unit cube, I sample like 100,000 points and label each of them whether it is inside or outside the model. And basically, for the super quadrics, you want to do the same thing. Is this point that is inside the ground truth mesh, is it also inside the predicted super quadric or not? So that essentially becomes the binary classification problem. Second is a shameful loss. So you can see here that because of how flat this, uh, the solar panels are, the occupancy loss becomes very unreliable for abstracting the shape of the solar panels. So the second loss here is the shameful loss, um, bidirectional shameful loss which essentially is used to close the distance between two sets of point clouds. So what this means is that first, 
uh, from the ground truth mesh, we need to sample the surface points um, as uniformly as possible. But we also need to sample points from the surfaces of the predicted primitives as well. And you also want, and you want to do it from the union of the super, um, uh, super quadrants. Now, in terms of the training data set, this was done as part of our Space Force project with SSCI, um, the company. And they have rendered these images for us. So we have nine satellite, satellites that we can get from the public NASA 3D model catalog. And they have generated 200 image, images each of random orientation of the spacecraft, but at fixed position um, from the camera. And as I said, the only labels that we have are the water type 3D meshes of these, uh, these uh, models uh, that are aligned according to principal components um, analysis. Now, this 100, 1,800 images is obviously not enough to train um, a functioning neural network, like functioning in a sense that you can deploy this um, to somewhere else. And as such, in this uh, presentation, I'm actually not distinguishing the training, validation, or test images. So my goal here is I want neural network to just memorize this thing. Memorize it, but be able to reproduce the 3D model that is as accurate as possible. And then we can talk about extending this to, okay, unseen image of a known of a seen spacecraft and to the unseen image of an unseen spacecraft. And this is just this is also a good way of validating if your loss function is working or not, and your neural network in check. It's a good way of debugging. So very quick qualitative uh, results here. On the left, we have the 2D image input. The middle column is the predicted assembly of, of uh, superquadrant primitives. And on the right, we have the 3D mesh of the target at exactly the same viewpoint. And here you see that, well, qualitatively speaking, they're pretty OK, I will say. Um, in terms of the extraction of the solar panels, some of them just goes for one superquadric extending in throughout the entire span of two um, solar panels, whereas here, it actually succeeded in identifying two separate solar panels, or like two separate parts. Uh, more interesting shapes are like these ones. So we still have two solar panels, but the main body actually has more parts in it. So here we have like a main body and also like some sort of like dish antenna and some other parts. And here we have the solar panels that are actually bending. So this is the case where clearly four super quadrants might not be enough. Um, as you can see here, we have some like bending here, but not uh, on the other side. And this input image. Input image to the neural network, yeah. That was used to generate that how? Yeah. The second one. Yep. And the third one? How you the third one? The third one is the ground truth, 3D mesh. So you created the, the third one, like on a CAD? No, so you can get these 3D mesh files okay. from NASA uh, website. Yeah, and the third one is also like pretty nice. We have like nice solar panel, and also it captures that. Um, kind of like dish-like parts, even though it's square. Also, one thing to note that <clears throat> is that there is no scale information um, for, of this abstracted shape. So that scale information also would have to be adjusted when you incorporate this into like SFM or SLAT. So qualitatively speaking, I would say I'm not too satisfied, mainly because a lot of the kind of cubic main body are just being uh, estimated as like this some um, very round shapes or like that, which doesn't make sense at all. Or like that as well, which is like more of a cylinder than a cubic shape. So there's definitely more work that can be done here by adding some more um, regularization in your training loss and, and so forth. And just to go back, the second row, though, like if I'm just looking at that picture mm -hmm. on the left, like I have no idea what shape that like that is a spacecraft. Right? No, you're absolutely correct. And like I said, my goal here is to just make the neural network memorize everything. So in here, 
you can also actually see the image from like like a viewpoint where you don't see the other solar panel, but it will still correctly identify the solar panel in your prediction because it just memorized it. But that was by design because I want this to be able to at least memorize well and reconstruct something that makes sense. This one is very light. Um, I'm using rest than 18, which is like a couple million parameters, which is which is on the lighter side. Um, like if you like it was kind of like the booms, like the, the beams are like the like the long antennas. Uh -huh. They yeah. kind of can be confused in that. I think there is a way of kind of like just focusing on the main body just for the picture. Like you really need the pixel which are like to far off from the main body. Mm -hmm. Because at the very end, I think you may care about like the pose and shape estimation of like the main body or then like. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, no, I agree. With, I, 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 I agree. To, I agree with find that. the problem for the net starting from like the you fit in. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. And that actually might be the reason why some shapes might not make sense because the points that are sampled from these booms might also be kind of attracting these shapes towards itself as well as part of the loss function. How, you, how are you outputting the relationship between the different quadrants? Like, what does that look like? Like, how do you get your. your Breaking four super four for each one, uh -huh. right? And then the relationship, or like, and then you're putting them together to reconstruct uh -huh. this guy. So, uh, I'm est I'm predicting the pose of each shape with respect to some global model, model frame. So I just use that information to plot uh, this. I'm not a machine learning expert, but I'm wondering if symmetry can be an exploitable factor since you're already targeting the most basic shapes. Mm -hmm. So symmetry can be applied here, um, especially because these nice satellites are the ones that have two solar panels on the side. Uh, but going forward, that is something that has to be accounted for like selectively because not all spacecraft has that sort of symmetry. One might have like, like and this is spacecraft, I don't know if you like can imagine it, but has just like one solar panel on its tail. So that is something that either has to be predicted, um, is this symmetric or not? Uh, but yeah, something that definitely can be exploited, at least in this project. Okay, so those are very quick um, qualitative results. Uh, I wish to include some quantitative results as well, but didn't have time, unfortunately, for this presentation. Have you tried on unseen similar Facebook? Oh, no, I just I didn't even try at all. Really? So not cool yet to see you. I'm more afraid of seeing <laughs> what it looks like. <laughs> okay, so in summary, shape extraction of unknown spacecraft, quote unquote, using superquadric primitives, except our neural network, ha neural network has seen the test images and re some reconstructions are a bit sus, and we're using constant number of primitives, uh, which is not ideal as well. So moving forward, um, within this framework of shape abstraction algorithm, uh, obviously, maybe some regulariza regularization in terms of the symmetry or uh, like there are other uh, regularization for losses in these kind of um, shape reconstruction. For example, you can try to um, predict the normal vector of the superquadric as well and try to align the normal that with the normal vector of the mesh as well. So that is like some other information that can be included in our training loss. And neural network architecture for perfect number of primitives. This is something that I'm still um, kind of like thinking about. Maybe this is something that needs to be done recursively. So you try to fit, find the main body, fit that first, and then try to fit the other ones. And eventually test on unseen images um, with some more confidence. Now, last, pro last slide. So this itself can be a PhD project of its own. Um, so. I try to think of like what are some like subtasks that one can try to tackle in order to, you know, make it really possible to extract and tr and track the pose of an unknown spacecraft and be able to do all the GNC magic around it. So obviously, smarter representation. I think moving forward, like the super quadrics might not be the way to go. And the reason I say is because. There are a lot of ambiguities of different shapes. Um, so you can see here, for example, 
for both solar panels, you can actually see that there are actually two different um, shapes that are like kind of 90 degrees apart. So we need a smarter representation that is does not rely on this kind of ambiguity. And it's also because even if there is like a better fit, at this point, it's very hard to train your network to like flip the, the orientation of this part. It's 90 degrees. So we need something smarter and also accounts for the moving parts. So right now we have just images of a one space graph with solar panels at certain orientation, but obviously these things are gonna move over the time. So you might want to basically predict that information as well. Like, is this the axis of rotation, right? And maybe um, try to account for it in our, in our training. And if we have more data, maybe we can do like some sort of rep representation learning, which means instead of all these explicit like super quadric size and shapes and all these explicit parameters, try to enco encode it in the same way that our Apple phone encodes people's face into some like latent space so that it can actually uh, detect people's face for you know unlocking your phone. More data. So we obviously need more space but it also might require more combination of different parts of spacecraft. So with limited amount of spacecraft variety, you know, you might want to, you know, put the solar panel in the random size, you know, make it truly random, like thus you'll have more data, which would require some labeling efforts, um, which kind of defies the whole point of unsupervised learning um, shown in this presentation. We might be able to rely on generative model, which again also in turn requires uh, good enough good enough of data to be able to interpolate between different shapes of spacecraft or since we don't have enough data to begin with maybe we should focus more on the few shot learning which means you try to learn as much of general information as possible from very limited um, number of data uh, and then leveraging sequential images. So once this is all done, now you can truly incorporate this into a slam with camel filter, for example, to really see how much of a kickstarting you can do with the shape abstraction. Or we can try to use some sort of recurrent neural network to refine the shape, um, abstract the shape information as well. And finally, um, the true evil of all machine learning in space, the domain gap. Uh, something that needs to be accounted for in this framework as well. So that would be the end of my presentation. Bye.